Hi, my name is Mason. I'm actually one of the anesthesiology residents at Hopkins. Um, we do have members from uh, the departments of orthopedic surgery, um, internal medicine, and I think a current med student at Hopkins who are also on their way down there somewhere on 95 right now, um, but they'll be here very soon. A um, little bit of background on me. I came here to College Park. I graduated in 2012 um, from the Department of Chemistry, went to the University of Maryland School of Medicine, graduated 2016, and I'll be finishing my anesthesiology residency next July. Um, so that's kind of my background. Grew up in Rockville, if any of you are from the area. Um, what do you guys want to know? Sorry, I'll talk right into this. So in the video, you can't. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, sorry. For everyone at home, uh, what do you guys want to know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. OK, so the question was, um, talk, just talk generally about the kind of journey through medical school, deciding on a specialty, difficulties faced during medical school, um, and I guess the journey I guess, through residency now as well. Um, okay, sure. So I'll, I'll actually start back in like college. I'll say I wasn't one of um, the sort of typical folks who might have considered being a doctor from a very young age. I actually came to it a little bit later. I actually started as an economics major uh, my freshman year and then started just taking more pre-med style classes, organic chemistry, stuff like that. Through that, fell in with a friend group who are all a bunch of pre-meds, kind of similar to this group here. And through them, started getting involved with shadowing and found out, man, this is really cool. Like actually finding a job that um, lets you mix science with working with people on a day-to-day -day basis and where you're continuously taking data and applying it to principles you've actually learned in the classroom to produce a little bit of, a little bit of good in the world on a day-to-day -day basis, even if that does sound super sappy. Um, so that's what got me interested in medicine in the first place. I was fortunate enough to land up in Baltimore at the University of Maryland for medical school. Um, and the first two years of medical school are, as you might know, they're very, very kind of book learning heavy. Maryland and most other medical schools do have, you know, programs that get you involved on the clinical side early and learning the basics of how to do a physical exam, how to take a history. But most of your time is spent in the classroom learning physiology, anatomy, um, the pathophysiology of diseases of the different organ systems. Um, and so I'd say in the beginning, it can be difficult just because you, you go to medical school with this expectation that you're going to be working in the hospital with patients directly. And initially, it can be kind of tough to get that feeling because you have to focus so hard on your book work. Um, it's not that tough in terms of like in-class time commitment. There's usually just a couple hours of lecture a day. Of course, there's tons of material you need to review, but it's, it's very adult learning oriented. You can do it on your own time. No one's sitting there in front of the class taking attendance. Um, a lot of people kind of review their lectures on their own and then meet up with study groups later, whatever's the most efficient method for you. Um, third and fourth year, you're going through your rotations. That's where you get to experience the different subspecialties by themselves. Um, I'd say I almost found anesthesia by accident a little bit. One of my first rotations was actually my surgery rotation is what I expected to be going into. Um, and you actually do anesthesia as sort of a, an add-on to that elective. And that's almost the only exposure I had before, before going on with the rest of my rotations. And I suddenly found out that what was going on um, on one side of the drape was maybe more interesting to me than what was going on in the other. And what I found that I liked about anesthesia specifically um, was that you could sort of immediately see the impact of the interventions you were making. So similar to what I was saying before about being in a clinic and using what you'd learned um, to basically produce a change, in anesthesia that change is immediate. You see a patient who's hypotensive, low blood pressure for some reason, you generate a differential of why you think that might be happening and you intervene right then yourself and then seconds later you can see if what you did made an impact um, which i found super interesting and gratifying it's like being in a physiology lab continuously um, every day you're there um, and so having kind of changed what i wanted to do um, a little bit late in the game i'd say in my third almost fourth year at that point um, fortunately that transition was made easier by a lot of my mentors who set me up with 
um, further sub-eyes and clerkships within anesthesiology, kind of nurtured an interest in critical care, um, which kind of aligns with anesthesia as well, um, and got me through the application process for residency. Um, so in terms of specific challenges during medical school, um, like I said, the first two years, very heavy on the book work. Um, if you don't find a good group of friends, it's, it's very possible to get isolated during that time. Fortunately at Maryland, you know, I, I knew a bunch of people who had been in my graduating class here who were going up that way. So there was already kind of a ready-made friend group. I'm from the area, so my family was close by. But certainly there were people who, you know, some of the folks who didn't show up to lecture a lot, didn't reach out and try to get um, social with our class, they, they felt isolated. Um, and that was very difficult for them, especially. Um, and then your second year when you're getting ready to take the first step of uh, step one, which is kind of maybe the biggest test you have to take in terms of applying to residency. It's, it's very stressful. It's similar to, you know, being in your last years of high school and studying for your, all of your APs and, you know, your, your SATs or ACTs, but it's all one test. And so that month or so leading into that, there's just a very palpable tension kind of around the entire medical school campus. Um, so that was a little bit difficult too. And then on your rotations, it can be difficult just to kind of find your place as someone who's only on a certain rotation with a certain team for a couple weeks. You want to establish yourself as someone who's eager to learn, helpful, but it can be kind of difficult to figure out exactly how to do that when it feels like almost, you know, you get to know people, you get to know the flow of a certain rotation. And just when you start to find your feet, you have to move on to another setting. Um, so yeah, I'd say those were probably the, the difficulties of being a medical student specifically. Um, but there's a lot of great resources at, at Maryland that I found, and yeah, you'll hear from the others who all went to different medical schools. Um, again, there's support systems from students who are ahead of you in terms of years who, you know, the, the second years would reach out to the first years and say, okay, hey, for for this teacher really likes to teach things in this way, but here's a different resource which might explain it better if you're a different kind of learner. Or when you're in second year, the third years might say, hey, you know, this attending is on this service when you're on your medicine clerkship. They like to do their presentations like this, give you tips for how to succeed. Um, there's a there's really collegial atmosphere. I didn't think it was like cutthroat competitive because at that point you're already, you're already in medical school. Um, and ultimately these people are gonna, some of these people are gonna end up being your colleagues. Um, when you're in residency or in practice later on. And it's good to sort of building a web of people who think of you positively. <laughs> Sorry, that was a super long-winded response. Um, <laughs> yes? So uh, during college, how much did you do in terms of like? Yeah, um, research in terms of stuff that was like directly related to medicine, not much, <laughs> like not much at all. Um, in the chemistry department, I actually, I did some stuff that was tangentially related to medicine. Actually, uh, so uh, I don't know if any of you are in um, like orgo at all, but Dr. Isaacs, I worked in his lab for a couple years and we were um, kind of working on these class of compounds, which ended up being related to something that became a fundamental medicine and anesthesia now, but all of our results were negative. So it didn't, it didn't end up relating directly. Um, in terms of clinical hours, though, I did quite a, quite a bit, especially in my junior and senior year. And that's something I feel like is actually a little bit difficult here on this campus, especially because when you compare like Maryland to like the University of Virginia or Johns Hopkins or a lot of other schools, but different here is that the medical school campus is 40 miles that way, which makes it a little bit tough for all of you in terms of finding like places to shadow or volunteer or scribe or things like that. Um, so I actually ended up going down to DC, hopping on the Metro. I met up with a cardiologist at George Washington who let me shadow um, basically whenever I wanted to come down and he was in clinic, which ended up being uh, like two to three times a month throughout my like junior, senior, of course, depending on like whatever classes, tests, stuff like that. It wasn't like two to three times a month, every single month. Um, but that was like my main source of clinical exposure. Um, a lot of my friends here who also um, ended up going to Maryland, a lot of them did the uh, the ER scribe program that is at, it was at a couple different hospitals. It was like at Anne Arundel Medical Center. I think there was one at Inova Fairfax. Um, there may be ones at other hospitals now too. Um, you could tell in our first year class who had done those programs though, because they really hit the ground running. It, it really helps you sort of speak the language of medicine a bit better and gets you again, more familiar with that whole process of 
learning how to get through a physical exam and like you've seen a bunch of people take histories before so you sort of know which questions are going to lead you in different directions um so that was something that was definitely highly regarded and effective in preparing people um but the, yeah those were kind of my big experiences welcome So yeah, my situation was a little unique. So um, my then girlfriend, now wife, was also applying uh, to medical school at the same time. We were both from this area. Um, staying close to family was a big thing for both of us. And obviously we wanted to go to medical school in the same city. Um, and just kind of the best mutual match for both of us, she ended up getting into school at Johns Hopkins and I ended up getting into Maryland. Um, and in terms of the other cities we were applying to, there wasn't a match that was as strong as that. Um, in terms of other things that Maryland's really strong in that really made me attracted, I wanted to do trauma surgery. <laughs> and Maryland's kind of really renowned for um, the R. Adams Cowley Shock Trauma Center. Um, and the trauma program there and the ICU experience that comes with it. Um, so that drew me there. Um, and then if you actually look at a lot of the hospitals in this area where a lot of the physicians trained and went to medical school, it's the most common place for people in the state of Maryland to have trained, which makes sense, but also for someone who's kind of looking to stay in this area long term, made a big, made a kind of made a lot of sense to stay there from that perspective also. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Something that's definitely being talked more at the medical school level and the residency level, and even more in like further in people's careers. Now, more talked about now than it probably has ever been before. Um, so actually right now, um, my residency program director, um, is probably one of the most active people in the country in terms of medical training and th thinking in terms of physician wellness and preventing burnout. Um, I'd say that's actually a big effort Hawkins has made as well. Um, and it, it, there, it, there's kind of a multidisciplinary approach to it where, um, the residency programs combined to have just little things that they do during the day um, at times that are actually somewhat convenient for residents uh, where they're actually set up and just say here there's there's food in this lounge no questions asked if you need a bite to eat because you've been rounding for however many hours straight drop in and grab it um, there's uh, li li like massage chairs that they set up in an office at other times again for residents only that you can just drop in and grab one of those um, they're also much more understanding now than they are in the past of people just needing to take breaks or needing time for family. Um, there's a, like much more appreciation for mental health than there has been in the past. I'd say that anesthesia is probably warmer to those ideas than a lot of other specialties. Um, for example, in like it, general surgery is still a very hard nosed place where you're expected to say that you work exactly your hour limit every week and not an hour more, even though everyone knows you've been there for over a hundred hours. Um, so that's, that's going to vary depending on what specialty you're looking at, um, and where exactly you're practicing. But at least my experience at, at Hopkins with anesthesia has been very positive in that regard. Yeah, I'd say not really. I mean, honestly, so again, in my residency program, there have been um, both DOs and MDs where certainly the majority are MDs, but there's at least one or two DOs in every year. We're also a very large program. There's like 25 of us a year. Um, and at least the couple of years before me, I think some of the strongest residents have been DOs. Um, the, the like two years before me, one of them ended up matching, staying at Hopkins doing cardiothoracic anesthesia, which is usually the most competitive subspecialty within anesthesia when you're applying for fellowships. Um, one of them was our, one of our chief residents last year. So at least from what I've seen, I don't think it's gonna kind of change much from our department. In fact, it should kind of open up a lot of opportunities for people coming from DO programs. Um, 
and I believe it's also that um, DO residencies that were previously exclusively DO residencies would be integrating MD applicants as well, correct? Um, so it's it's going to offer more options kind of from everyone coming through. Um, I'll admit that I don't know as much about the kind of the DO training path. I know there are differences in terms of the education at the medical school level and the residency level. I'm not exactly sure what they are in every single case, though. So perhaps one of my colleagues who will be joining us later can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I'm overall kind of happy that they're doing it. <laughs> and from what I've seen, everyone can certainly play in the same pool. Sure. I'd be hesitant to do that. Um, so actually, when, when I was applying, um, Virginia Tech's medical school, Carillion, was basically just opening, just starting to be brand new. Um, and I believe it was still going through kind of the accreditation phase of things. And... You know, obviously all the facilities you're going to be using are going to be brand new and a lot of people are going to put a lot of effort into making sure that you have a good experience. But anytime something's brand new, you know there's bound to be hiccups. <laughs> um, and I just felt like going to a place that was a little bit more established where both the curriculum, the faculty had kind of a proven track record was a better bet in terms of your education, which of course you're only going to get to go through once, knock on wood. <laughs> Um, Kaiser's program in particular, I, I don't know a lot about it, but those were my thoughts, at least at that time with a similar situation, um, with Virginia tech school. Um, and since then I know it's, it's, it's gone pretty smoothly. I don't think there's been any big hiccups for them, but that was just not something I wanted to have to deal with, um, during the medical school time. Um, the whole question of Kaiser also running a medical school is a, is an is also an interesting one, <laughs> but yeah. So is NYU, which I I think that's got to be the best deal in the country right now. They're about to recruit some amazing people. Oh, well, yeah, obviously. God, that was an amazing idea that they had. It's like they're going to get the best med students in the country now because everyone's going to want to go there. If you didn't already want to live in Manhattan while you're in medical school, which a lot of people do. Um, so yeah, I mean, it seems like that would be a better way to get your medical school paid for. <laughs> um, a lot of my friends did the, the military programs too while they were in medical school. And in fact, while you know, the rest of us were drawing out student loans, they were drawing a salary. Um, obviously, the disadvantage with that, with the military programs, is that you don't get as much of a choice into the specialty you go into. With a lot of them, you have to kind of just do a general internship or general medicine type of track. And then you've, it's a little bit of a roll of the dice if you have a specific subspecialty that you want to go into if you actually end up there. It kind of depends on what the Navy or the Army is looking for at that point. Um, but it's a, certainly a great way to save a lot of money while you're in medical school. You get you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt written off immediately, and you're actually drawing an income, a, a good income, while you're in med school. But you do owe, I think it's like 10 years afterwards. And not everyone wants to go to the military, obviously. Are you guys like in the application process now? Or are you in like your first couple years? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry for the guide. Okay. So yeah, that was, I was kind of on a similar path to you two. I took the MCAT, it's either like the end of my junior year, beginning of my senior year, but while, I, but while I was still here, um, and then both my wife and I went straight through to medical school. I certainly doing that while you're in school is, is difficult. It's like, you've already got a ton to study for and it's more on top of that. Um, it's manageable though. And I'd say, I'd say of the people in my medical school and hers though, we were a little unusual. 
Um, not at this point, most people are taking a gap year or two to either get your MCATs done, uh, get more research experience, get more clinical experience. But either either way is viable. You just have to um, be very efficient while you're in college if you're doing both at the same time. Um, yeah, I'd say kind of the average person had probably taken one or two years afterwards. Um, for, for everyone who's not at that point yet, you've got plenty of time to kind of figure it out. And I'd say, again, the, the shadowing, the scribing, volunteering, that's really where you're going to make your mind up about if this is something you really want to do. And what I'd say about the application process in general, um, obviously, you need, to, you need to have your grades, you need to have your test scores. Those are the things that are going to open the door for you. Um, the interview, though, is where you're really going to solidify your place in a class somewhere. And I'd say my biggest takeaway from the interviews was that they're looking to make sure that you really know what you're signing up for and that you really want to be in medicine. Um, thinking about it from their perspective, it takes a ton of resources to train a doctor. And that's really what makes a slot in medical school precious, not just because they artificially say, okay, we're taking 150 people, but because there's, there's a big opportunity cost to that, right? And if someone um, ends up not completing that course, you always wonder about that next person who could have done a lot of good with that spot. And so I'd say, you know, one of the biggest things they're looking for is evidence that you've been in a clinical scenario, you've spent a lot of time around the hospitals, and you know what it's like, and you know that this is something you want to do with your life, because that's really the scenario they don't want to see is someone who gets into medical school, gets like nine months in, and is like, ah, this isn't for me for one reason or another. Um, so I, I would keep that in mind when you get to your interviews that that's, those are qualities that they really want to see beyond the, you know, the academic achievements and things like that. Um, did you ever have moments where you were Totally. <laughs> and anyone who you know, like, goes through medical school and says that's not the case is lying to you. Like, let's be serious. Like, there's definitely times when you're on a rotation that you don't find particularly interesting and it's the middle of the night and you've got friends who are saying, oh, we're going to be in town tomorrow. You're having to tell them, no, I won't be there because I'm going to be on call again. And where you think to yourself, what am I doing here? <laughs> um, but there's plenty of other moments that make it worth it. <laughs> Um, there's, there's a lot of sacrifices though. I'm not going to lie. And from the other thing I'd probably like to say is that it's not an easy path in terms of like when you're in medical school or afterwards also, um, including financially, like I know there's a lot of people who, you know, want to be a doctor because part of the appeal is, oh, you know, doctors are rich. I have friends who, you know, study comp sci here and engineering and they're off working for Amazon and Google right now. And got to meet up with them in Vegas a couple of years ago and they were playing blackjack at a completely different table from me. Like they were like, Oh, let's go to the hundred dollar table. And I was like, ha, no. <laughs> Cause um, you know, obviously like we don't, you don't get to draw much of a salary until you're any salary at all until you're in residency. And then you're not really making good money until you get out of residency. Um, so along with the sacrifice in terms of time and effort, which is true, no matter what field you go into, keep in mind that it's going to take a while for kind of the financial side of things to kick in for you too. Um, but again, my job is really cool. I, I never have to worry about coming in and wondering like, am I really making a difference today? What's the point of what I'm doing? Um, which makes it a lot easier to wake up early. Who? Yes. Uh, honestly, not really. That's not <laughs> so. For anesthesia, what I can talk about is the process of joining a group right now, which is something I'm like kind of actively doing at the moment. So I, I'm not planning on doing a fellowship. I'm going into private practice after this year. Um, and so for anesthesia specifically, at this point, there are very few true private practice groups in this area. Um, as with most other areas of the country, what we're seeing is the generation of big health systems where, say, University of Maryland is buying up hospitals in St. Joe's and they're buying up hospitals in PG County and on the Eastern Shore and Hopkins is doing the same thing and MedStar is doing the same thing around the D.C. area. Um, and nationwide, the same thing is happening to a lot of anesthesia groups. 
groups that were private practice that had contracts with different hospitals or different surgery centers are kind of getting bought out by larger regional and national groups. In this area, I'm only aware of like two groups that currently have private um, contracts with hospitals. And so with those groups, um, basically, you know, you, there's an application process not dissimilar to what you'd go through for a fellowship, though I'd say what I've found is that personal connections have made a bigger difference um, than, again, test scores necessarily. Um, but otherwise, you're getting brought in for interviews. They're wanting to make sure that you're a person who matches the culture and skills they need to see at their hospital for the job they're offering. Um, but it, it still feels like a similar application process to medical school. For the more national groups, it's almost like you're applying for a job outside of medicine. There's like an online process you go through and then a recruiter might get in contact with you if they like what they see and then they'll talk about stuff that's available in your area. That whole setup is gonna be very different depending on what specialty you're talking about though. That whole process is true for anesthesia. General surgery still has some private practice, like true private practice setups in this area. And if they're present in this area, they're going to be present in most of the rest of the country as well. Um, and internal medicine, I know, has seen a trend towards more what I'm seeing in anesthesia, but not to the degree that my specialty has. Um, so in a couple months, when I start getting job offers, I can tell you a little bit more about... <laughs> the process of buying in um, as someone coming in brand new. Um, but the other thing I'll say is that at least with the anesthesia groups I've seen, there's basically two tracks that they're offering at this point. There's a partnership track, which is kind of the more traditional way where you work for several years um, at kind of a lower salary, but at the end of it, you come out as a partial owner of the practice. Those positions are, again, becoming a little bit more rare. What's more common now is more of an employee track where you're working for one of these national groups, which are publicly traded companies. And there is a graded pay scale where the longer you stay with them, the more money you make. But you're never hitting that point where they say, congratulations, you're now a part owner of the company, along with the 10 other people who founded it. So that's something I've been struggling with for the last couple of years, actually. So, um, so private practice doesn't necessarily mean you're not in a hospital setting, um, but it means you're not at an academic center necessarily. So again, a place like University of Maryland or George Washington or Hopkins. Um, so initially what I thought I wanted to do was actually cardiothoracic anesthesia, which is kind of, in my mind, the, the big sexy subspecialty of anesthesia where people are super sick and complications are horrible and you get to use all the really cool drugs and all the really cool monitors all the time. Um, after getting to rotate through there though, it's super, super draining. And I found like I was more exhausted after that month than I had been at any other point. I found that I really, really liked it, but honestly, I couldn't see myself being successful and happy doing that every single month for the rest of my life. Um, and so at that point I started to think about what I really liked about anesthesia. And one of the things I really enjoy about it is the variety, um, as opposed to the surgical subspecialties where at this point you might become an ear, nose, throat specialist, and then you might subspecialize and be, oh, okay, I'm just the person who does this one sinus surgery and then they are just gonna do that one sinus surgery four times a day for their career. In anesthesia, you know, one day you might be with that guy doing sinus surgery. The next day you might be on the labor and delivery floor placing epidurals and helping women get through childbirth. The next day you might be doing nerve blocks. The next day you might be doing vascular cases. You get to see a little bit of everything. And each of those different scenarios presents different challenges in terms of the physiology of the patients coming to you and what you need to do for them to help them be successful in the surgery. And private practice is really where you get to do that full general spread of cases. If you go to an academic center, again, things are becoming more and more subspecialized. If you're the heart guy, you're doing hearts. If you're doing, if you're the nerve block guy, you're doing nerve blocks and people get a little bit touchy and territorial. Whereas if you're out in the community, you're the guy, you do the anesthesia, <laughs> whatever the anesthesia might be that day. So that's what kind of sent me more in that direction.
time pressure. It's time pressure is 100% my answer to that. Um, and, it, and it kind of pervades multiple different areas of medicine. Um, it, when you're in medical school, um, one of the one of the, the the ideas that's always in kind of in the back of your mind, which which really sucks, is the the idea that you don't want to be the person slowing things down. That you know that your team has to see twenty patients on rounds, and you don't want to have your presentation be slow or take up a ton of time because you know that everyone else in the group is going to have to kind of pick that up. And that idea comes forward in residency too. So now in anesthesia, for example, if someone's about to go into surgery, you have to talk to them and get their consent for the type of anesthetic you're planning. And you might only get a couple minutes in the room with them to kind of assess them, verify their history, and then talk to them about the plan and the associated risks and benefits of it and try to really make them understand what they're signing up for. Um, and that's a conversation where if you really went into all the detail that you would need to cover all of that with every person, you could talk for hours and you it's and it's just not possible with how efficiently things have to run for the hospital to function um and so i find that really difficult with a lot of patient care scenarios where if like you know that if you had longer to spend on a certain topic that things could be a little bit better or if you had more time to talk to this patient after surgery about the type of pain they're having and figure out how you could best address that that they might have a little bit better outcome. But unfortunately, with the kind of pressure to produce that exists in American medicine right now, you can't spend as much time as you want with every single patient. And I find that really regrettable sometimes. Yeah, that I, I don't think that's going to change at all. I mean, like e even right now, um, it, unfortunately, a lot of things do come back down to money. And for example, right now in the operating room, if, if a case is supposed to take 90 minutes, every minute over that it takes for some reason means the next case is getting delayed by that amount of time, which means that you know your patient who's taking that extra time is gonna take a little bit longer to recover and maybe has to spend the night in the hospital now instead of going home that same day. It also means that at the end of the day, you're having to bring on kind of overtime people to finish the room that's now running late. Um, and all of that, all of that is very costly. And given now that there's starting to be a big public focus on the costs of healthcare and what we can do to improve and minimize that, I don't think that pressure is going to go away. And you see that again, not just in my specialty, but in other specialties, like in family medicine, people are having to take on larger number of patients than they have in the past and more complex patients as well. And the duration of a normal, you know, healthy visit is being cut down from what it is was before um a lot of uh, the obs are under pressure to be covering more laboring patients for example than they were in the past or to be more efficient with their c-sections so they, they can have more c-sections scheduled for a given day um so i i don't think that trend is going to go away um it is going to open up a lot of opportunities for people like nurse practitioners, physician assistants too, because a lot of what they do is make things more efficient. Hello, um, for physicians by, you know, for example, for the surgeons, helping with the um, non-essential parts of the cases, allowing people to cover more than they were able to do so before. Um, but that's something that's definitely going to be present for the duration of, I, ex I expect, our careers and anyone who's coming up now as well. <laughs> right. So we, get another chair? No. we have another set of folks here, <laughs> also from Hopkins. I will pass the microphone down so everyone can say hello. Hi, I'm Allie. I'm one of the orthopedic surgery residents at Hopkins. Hey, I'm Krista, I'm one of the fourth year medical students. I'm Michael, I'm also a fourth year med student. Tiana is a medicine resident at Hopkins, and I'm going to go look for her. <laughs> All right. Um, so I've just been kind of rambling on about my experience in medical school and, and residency and stuff like that. Um, some of the questions that have come up so far have included, I guess, uh, questions about kind of the 
um, transition from college to medical school, difficulties of your life in medical school, um, any issues you had adjusting to kind of the, the pace of things or studying in medical school, and I guess um, things you would have wanted to know about that transition. Um, so. Um, so one thing that is quite different about when you approach learning in med school is that um, first is a lot more self-directed and that's something that was a transition also from high school to college, right? You have to study on your own. But the thing that makes med school a little trickier is that the amount of material is amplified by, by significant amount, um, which can make the self-directed learning more challenging. And oftentimes you'll have material that's covered in a lecture that doesn't always correspond with what is expected on some standardized tests, but you still have to do good on both of them. So that can be sometimes a, a difficult um, balance to strike. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on what you guys are doing right now. I didn't really do like biology or chemistry. I took two years off, three years off. Um, and I did architecture school, so it depends what you do. I think the biggest thing for you is learning to be tenacious in whatever you do and not giving up, because a lot of times you're going to feel like there's a lot going on and you have to decide what's important to you, and sometimes you're not going to be the person that gets to 99 anymore. You're going to be a person that maybe is a standard deviation below or standard devi deviation above. So um, just finding your own learning pattern and sticking to it I think is really important um, and not jumping around everywhere. Another thing. Um, so then in your third year or earlier, you transition to learning on the wards in the hospital, which is like the, the most different thing you can imagine. It's you leave the book at home, you learn from the patient, you're in the hospital for way more hours than I ever spent doing anything else in my entire life, um, especially studying. Um, and then you have to study at home. So it becomes a lot of like time management um, and really understanding. Um, it's a very different style of learning than taking a test when you're caring for a patient in the hospital. Um, but then you still have to take tests. So it's like the best of both worlds, right? So. Thoughts about like transition from college to medical school, difficulties during medical school. After you. Difficulties going into residency. Difficulties with transitions at multiple steps. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, it's always a transition. There's always going to be. This, there's always going to be a learning cur curve. Exactly. Like you will, 100 percent, pretty much all the time, feel like you're drinking from a fire hose, and that's fine. You just, at some point in time, need to just like remember to drink at some point in time and you'll get it all eventually. Uh, nobody does this in one year or two years. There's a reason why like medicine is three, four years, three years, three years, <laughs> three year residency. Uh, like most gen surge programs are six or seven. Ortho is like five years. Like there's a reason why it takes time. You're not trying to do this all at once. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine it was quite a transition for you guys when you went from high school to, to college, even as like much as any professor tried to prepare you for anything when you were in high school. I'm Tiana, by the way. Um, but I think every, taking it in stride and being, I think tenacious is a good, a good word. Just uh, focusing and also sort of being forgiving as you adjust to, to the new learning environment. And it's going to be different at every single stage. It's going to be different first year of med school from second as you learn what works for you. It's going to be different how you learn from fourth year of med school into residency. And it's just, uh, I think, a lot of keeping as positive a, a mindset as you can about it. I'll say that I think there's a lot more independent learning that goes on. Uh, and what they, uh, what the people tell us is adult learning. Um, Whatever that means, exactly. Uh, yeah, just time management is important. Do you find that people along, like, residency, like, do you find that people are, like, supportive and, like, there for you, or is it mostly, like, a you're here, be self sufficient? I think people are very supportive. I went to med school in Arizona, though, so, like, very different experience, I think, maybe, than. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know. I think as much as like it is very self-driven learning, but at the same time, it's it's a lot about what you make of it. And so I think what a lot of people, 
choose to make of it is a lot of like group study sessions and like bouncing ideas off each other. And then in the hospital, like you function as a part of a team. And so the goal is to find a medical school or residency, et cetera, that like is surrounding you with people that are like-minded individuals that you feel like you can get along with and that you want to work with day in and day out, that you want to study with for hours at a time and that you want to, you know, be in the hospital overnight with. So I, I, I would say yes. Yeah, and a lot of that is, I mean, if you're not the type of person that enjoys the group study, that's fine too. Like finding a med school that works for you is very much like shopping, right? So some people want like, lots of people at their backyard barbecue, other people just want themselves and that's fine. Um, I mean, I think all of us are probably a little bit more uh, the talkative group think type of people. So that's what you're going to get with us. And I mean, we go to school like right up the road here and stuff like that. I mean, town is from far right away. The <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, uh, Mason and I chose to go to med school in Maryland because our families are from Maryland and we're from Maryland. And obviously here we are now for residency and we're back for more. Uh, so we decided to keep our support system very close to us. That's not to say that they know all the time what you're going through. Like there's plenty of birthdays that are like, oh my gosh, it's your second cousin's uncle's like kid's baptism. And you're like, super. Um, so you're not going to be able to make it to everything, but you learn how to prioritize. Yeah, I mean, um, so it depends if you have a significant other. I think Allie outlined that well. I have that, and I think that's a huge, huge part of my life. And if I didn't have that, things probably would be quite different. Um, but also, once you get to med school, um, and even here, you have mentors that you see every day in your career. Um, so I've had multiple people, multiple physicians, residents who have been by my side since day one. Um, and I think they're really part of how I grew up and how I was part of their culture and um, hopefully pass it down kind of thing. So, Yeah, and, and just in general, I mean, a lot of medical schools have unique cultures and it really is like shopping around. If you're fortunate enough to have the opportunity um, to select between multiple medical schools, um, you have the opportunity to visit, go to Second Look Weekend, which are events where they have like showcase of different types of stuff about the schools. Um, and that can be a, a very good feel for the culture of that school. And then even for residency after you get to visit and spend time with the people who you'll be surrounded with. And that can make a, it did for me, it made a decision point to attend Hopkins for medical school instead of other schools that would have made me a fantastic, you know, physician in training, but I didn't feel I was supported or that people had my back because those are things I was actively seeking. And no surprise, it's the same thing I say for residency interviews right now because it's something I value so highly and so it really comes to what you value. Yeah, I have no like real life experience. And I, I, I like really commend and admire my classmates who do like gap years, research years, whatever you do. I think for the most part, everyone who has those brings a whole slew of experiences and knowledge to to med school, to residency with that. So I think there's only only good things to be gained from that. Yeah, so technically I guess I took three years from like my undergraduate. So I finished my undergraduate, took two more years for post back, and took a year off in um, the supplement industry. Um, so I think overall it gives you a good learning experience of how the real world works and how people overall think. So it depends what you're interested in that gap year. If you want to do research, I know a lot of people in our class that took a year off and did like NIH funded research. Um, but yeah, volunteering, all sorts of things. It, some people um, in our recent classes did Peace Corps for a few years and Teach America and things like that. So it, the biggest thing is if you take a gap year and you do something with that year, it has to be meaningful to you and you have to be able to talk about it. So um, it's the same thing if we took a research year, if I took a research year right now and came out with no publications and no accolades or something, it's going to look a little odd, right? So if you're going to do something, make sure you make it worth it and like talk to advisors who are specialized in advising students from Maryland about 
Exactly, because they know. So, like, where I went to college in Indiana, we had very strong advising, and I was like, you tell me what to do. Like, you know it's your job. So it's their job to tell you how to get into medical school. And believe it or not, they get paid for that. So, um, you know, if you have some area where you weren't able to attain in a college four years, kind of an experience in volunteering or research, and you want to explore that and strengthen that application, that would be the time to do it. I feel old, and I wanted to finish quickly, so I just went straight to medical school. I'm going straight to residency. I'm going to probably do a damn fellowship, and then I'll call it quits after that. Um, so just really, because that's something, again, I value. It's something I want for my life, and I, I did not see that added benefit for me personally, but it is a case-by-case. I think there's a lot of reasons to take a gap year, whether or not it be between undergrad and med school or med school and residency. Uh, as Krista said, you need something to show for it. But also, sometimes you're just not ready. Like, who among us like really, really know what we want to be when we grow up? Very few. And we're shuttled along in high school, put on these train tracks, and just told to get through college and decide what you want to be. Take a year if you're not 100% committed to putting yourself into however much debt from college, putting your life on hold for residency and everything else and sacrificing so much of your time and effort. There's a lot of great things that you can do in this world. And I'm very happy as a future orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and I feel like I live an enchanted life, but this is what I've, this is what I've wanted to do for a while. And if you need a year to really feel like you are going to own that decision in that lifestyle, do it. Because once you get started, it's really hard to back out. Much better that you like spend time exploring this and then are certain about your decision than can talk about that decision with certainty in whatever interview process you partake. Then you're like, I think I should probably do this. And then you get two years into whatever medical school residency and are like, I don't know, this is not exactly what I thought it was going to be. So you can, you can, and people do use it to strengthen their applications to sort of build a foundation of what kind of career they want in medicine, or they use it to really like explore and get down to, do I think I could best like serve people as a physician, maybe public health, maybe, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that you can do. And I think you should, and owe it to yourself before you put yourself in like large amounts of debt. Um, and it's like sleep debt too, but like explore, I think explore that um, and, and feel, feel free to. And I think that, that that's only going to give strength to once you make that decision. Would you like to talk about advising at Maryland? He's been here. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'd like to echo the point that the advisors here can be an incredible resource. Like everything else we've kind of talked about regarding medical school and residency though, it, a lot of it has to start with you at least my experience here was that they weren't going to, you know, come track you down and say, hey, I heard you were interested in going to medical school. Here's a bunch of stuff you might want to know. But if you take the time to go to them and say, here's what I'm interested in. Here's what I think I need to be working on. Can you help me, you know, find someone to shadow with or find, help me find someone who needs help doing research in, in an area like this or help me explore this interest or just say, you know, here's my profile. What do you think I need to do to improve my chances? then they will be your best advocate. And when it actually comes time to putting the application together, they're the ones who kind of know how the whole thing works and can tell you, okay, these are places that I think you'd be a great fit at and match this, have strong programs in the specialties you're looking at. Um, but again, it has to kind of start with you and your own initiative to go to them and say, hey, this is me, what can you, what can you do for me? <laughs> And more so speaking to what the advisors do in your application portfolio, uh, remember at the end of this, they have to actually put it all together and you are required to have a letter from them. You, like you have to, or else your application goes right into the trash. Uh, so it really behooves you to start to get to know them very early so that their letter isn't just a regurgitation of what everybody else says. So you know I'm doing ophthalmology. Uh, so Marinaz and I worked on research together. So uh, we go back. Um, 
So I decided to be an eye surgeon because I had a formative experience at the beginning of medical school where I was able to volunteer in the community. The reason I became a physician or wanted to go to medical school was serving in an uninsured clinic in my hometown for several years. So I saw the impact that vision care has and lack thereof and um, just the amazing improvements you can make in a very short period of time um, with amazingly technical, sophisticated, um, and, uh, you know, cutting edge technology. So um, that's why I'm doing what I'm gonna do. So I'm applying to orthopedic surgery. Um, I came in thinking maybe ortho or some sort of uh, surgical subspecialty. I found that ortho fit my personality the best and then also the fact that I like to think a lot in imagery. So reading like CT images, MRI images, I'm able to sort of make that in my head and think how I can fix things uh, easier, um, at least at this very young blossoming age. Um, but that was something that I really admired. And I admired the fact that a lot of the things you could do in ortho would be a fix that could like dramatically change someone's life. Even if it was like a, a cancer patient, uh, you can give them valuable months or weeks to ambulate and go around with their families. If it's a kid that has a deformity, um, you're able to fix the way they inter interact with the world. So you're really just changing the way someone can um, interact with the world. And that to me was invaluable and no other specialty for me was about that, so. You guys will get a sense of this, I think, as we all talk, that just it's it's a lot of um, what you like to think and do, and then also sort of what personality of other physicians sort of fits yours. Um, I also don't, I personally believe that there's not really necessarily like one only specialty that like everyone has to be happy in. Like I think a lot of us had like a couple like second or third choices that would have made us really happy. Um, but to that extent, I'm an internal medicine resident. I'm a senior, so I'm interviewing for fellowship right now. Um, and I'm applying for pulmonary and critical care medicine. And my draw to that is just that I, internal medicine specifically, like in my head, that's what a doctor is. And that's what I wanted to do when I went to medical school. But beyond that, I like taking care of patients at their absolute sickest. And I think, you know, oftentimes we don't fix them, but I think when you do, it's, it's pretty miraculous. And then I was a physiology major as an undergrad and I've always like adored physiology and the MICU is a physiology lab at the bedside. And I think Mason will probably echo this a little bit in anesthesia, but like, <laughs> perfect. Um, but so you have like all of that data real time. And so you're making like very educated, informed decisions about your patient based on like a deep understanding of their own personal physiology. So I, I really enjoy that. And you also don't like lose sight of, in internal medicine, if you specialize, you can often lose sight of other organ systems. Like the heart is be all end all, or like the liver is be all end all. And in critical care, you can't do that and you shouldn't, so. True. Uh, Where is orthopedics? <laughs> I have great colleagues that can speak to the nuances of physiology. <laughs> um, uh, I actually wanted to go into medicine from a very, very young age and basically tried out a lot of things along the medical spectrum before I decided that medical school actually was for me. And when I first got to med school, I wanted to do neurology. Uh, my major in undergrad was neuroscience, so this uh, really tilled nicely together. Um, I did a fair amount of work in behavior labs and Parkinson's labs, and I loved the physiology of like the micro stuff, like teeny tiny, right? That was great. And then uh, I really enjoyed doing the physical exam with the patients, and I enjoyed having a very active physical exam and being able to get a diagnosis and knowing like what the problem was just from your physical exam. But I felt frustrated for me personally about what the next step is. So that's where uh, your exam plus the next step of surgery worked really nicely for me. Um, particularly uh, interested in peds and deformity cases. Uh, so it's not necessarily just what the x-rays look like, but it's also how that impacts how they function in regular life, what their physical exam is like. It's not just, oh, great, perfect, femur fracture, I'm gonna fix it. Uh, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, and uh, that's what drove me into orthopedics. I was lucky to have some incredible mentors at Hopkins uh, who were encouraging and wanted me to do the best I could wherever that was, uh, and here I am at Hopkins again. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's why orthopedics. 
think I've talked about anesthesia ad nauseum at this point, but just to review, it's again, a physiology lab, one where you get to see the direct impact of your interventions as you kind of take over homeostasis completely for the course of one anesthetic. Um, so you get a ton of instant gratification where you know that you are directly making an impact. It offers you a variety of different cases and patients to work with. And those are really the things that drove me towards anesthesia. I'll say that we also have a lot of uh, interests other than just being in the hospital. Um, to a large degree, I think a lot of our medical colleagues will do a lot of public health efforts, and there's a lot of international clinics that go on that dovetail nicely with the medicine department. Um, It'd be really nice if I was involved with any of those. That's and okay. Like, then I could like talk about them. <laughs> but yes, that's true. We also do like regular life stuff. Like we play volleyball together. Like we hang out. We play board games sometimes. Like it's not all medicine all the time. <laughs> So you balance your work life, your work life balance. Then. Yeah, that's a that I hate that phrase, work life balance. <laughs> there is no work life balance. I think there's like some comedy skit that's like, okay, you get to choose sleep, you get to choose work, or you get to choose friends. Like you know, like you only get to have a few at any given moment. Um, it's just prioritizing what's important to you. I get to uh, work and bring home home with me. Uh, this is my husband. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We were married well before working together. We're also kind of awkward sometimes. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Been awkward it's for a couple of years. Fine. It comes in waves. There's no like perfect formula that like someone who's like a truly happy like physician is like, oh, every day I like wake up and I work out and I make breakfast and then I go work 80 hours in the hospital. And then like it comes in waves. It ebbs and flows at any point during like college, during med school, during residency, you'll have harder, busier times and then less busy and easier times during which you'll be able to do maybe more of what, like more extracurriculars, more things that are like fun to make you, you as a person. And then sometimes you have to commit like as an exam is coming up to studying a lot more. Um, so I wouldn't, I would like warn against framing it as like a perfect balance that you can achieve if you just try hard enough. Like, like Mason was saying, we like play volleyball together. I played volleyball a lot in high school and it's something that makes me really happy, but I did not have time for that like much my intern year at all, but we're doing it a lot now because life's a little better. Right. And um, there's a reason why like there's 12 people in our team. Yeah, 12 people and like usually like five show up. <laughs> They're all residents, but that's, that's all I'll sort of say about that. Just sort of find like the, few core things that like are part, part of your identity and that make you happy, like just for you, not for any like CV, make sure you dedicate some time to those every like week, month, something like that. Yeah, I think that's important. I think uh, at this stage, you guys tend to just do a lot of things and sometimes it comes off as check boxes. And I remember when people first came into med school, they're like, oh, I'm really interested in like this and this and this and this, and I need to continue doing all this. And I watched a lot of people burn out really quick. So I think it comes to the point of what are the most important things to you in life? So for me, like I wanted to power lift. That's all I wanted to do. And I wanted to like spend time with my wife and maybe like like a couple other things. And so like on my application, like I, oh, and mentoring. So I spent a lot of my time and just focused around mentoring my younger colleagues to high school students and stuff like that. Um, and then I just went to the gym. So like your first two years, like that's all the time in the world. You will have so much time, especially if you go to a pass, if, if there's any advice I give today, <laughs> go to a pass, full, uh, pass fail school. Like it doesn't matter. Like Maryland pass fail? For, nope. yeah. <laughs> so the University of Arizona yeah, like Not honestly, I mean, it's not to say like you still need to learn and you still need to do well in step one if you have any aspirations for any, and honestly, everything is getting more and more competitive. So you're going to have to learn the material, but getting that pass fail, especially in your first and second years, you'll have the, the flexibility to do what you want. Your third and fourth years will vary. Um, like I had to do sub internships for the past like four months. I had no life. Um, I didn't get to go to the gym. I didn't really hang out with my spouse, you know, things like that. So that was not great but you're like getting towards what you want. Um, so I think it's not a work-life balance, but more like a work-life shift. And you just need to go in certain directions at times. And a lot of it is like, I mean, if you guys are like 18 to 21, like I still don't, I'm still figuring out what's important to me, but I've really, when you are faced with so little time to do things, you that's when you find out what's important to you, why it's because the stuff you continue to do. Um, and then 
I think for me that was really clarifying because it was like, I'm going to prioritize cooking a meal every single evening, no matter how hard it's going to be. And if I have to plan ahead, because I value nourishing my body, um, I value spending time with my significant other and you know, sharing meals as often as possible. And those things are just as, as, as non-negotiable as I can make them. And as a medical student, you can. Sometimes you can, but for the most part, you can. But as these guys said, it's a lot about identifying and then committing yourself to pursuing the things that, that will give you the drive and the wellness to just pursue care of yourself so you can care for others. Um, I think putting things into perspective uh, at least helps me not burn out. Uh, like these next two weeks for me are going to be a lot of late nights. Well, it's not as early as they used to be at one point in time, but early or nights and just a lot of work ahead. Um, but you know, like two months ago, I went on a study abroad trip, if you will, to Micronesia, and that was awesome. And so finding a way that whatever frame that you want to look at it, whether it be like, I'm going to look at one week and be like, okay, this is where I got my energy from. Or for me, I kind of function better looking at two or three months spans of time. So I can kind of just ignore two weeks of bitterness and like not so awesomeness, if you will, but on the whole, as long as things are glass half full every two months or so, I feel pretty good about myself. Um, and I think everybody needs to find their own perspective, perspective about what you were saying, like what makes you happy and what makes you feel like you are healthy enough to take care of other people. I think like the way you asked the question, like you, I think you have a sense as to what like the, the 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 landscape i guess is of physician burnout right now and i think we all touched on it in a way it's like there's not ever going to be a time when everything is like every single day pg keen like things are easy i have like some work i have like some play and i think things will come and go in terms of difficulty in terms of maybe some days you feel more burnt out and then you identify the things that make you very happy and are meaningful to you and then you sort of fill that tank and then you're able to to go back to work um i think this is not meant to like, what's the word, like in any way, like push you guys away from like medicine. I think it's a really like important calling and something you should stick with, but medical school is hard. Residency is hard and like they're, they will be very hard at times. I think the, the plan is sort of learning to cultivate what matters to you and then making sure that whatever sort of field or specialty you sort of find yourself leading into leaves room for you as a person, just like Ali said. Yeah, I think it's also a lot of just finding your home. You know, like for me personally, I would have not done well in an internal medicine residency. And finding like my home of my people, whether or not it's the specialty or whatever residence you end up going into, you need to find a home where you feel safe enough to be yourself, whatever that is. Um, and I think when people decide what they want to do first without really thinking, is it right for them? And does it dovetail with their personality? I think that's when people can get burnt out really quickly. It goes back to, I think, the questions about like gap years and I think other things that you're going to do to cultivate your interests and decide what kind of a career you want, which may not end up being medicine and that's fine. And it may end up being medicine and that's fine. Um, but it's, it sounds silly to be like, oh, be sure this is what you want to do and explore every facet of it. But like, one of my really good friends who is in his third year of internal medicine residency has a father who's a cardiologist and for like seven years has been like, I'm going to be a cardiologist. And like three months ago was like, I don't like this. It's like kind of late. Right. But it's, it's also okay. Cause he has a lot of exposure to other fields and he can take a year extra after residency to 
be a hospitalist and figure out what kind of fellowship he wants to go into. So don't ever feel so boxed in by the train tracks that you often get put on in this path that you can't like explore other options. And if something doesn't feel right, you can find something that does. And I think that's the best way you can sort of hope to prevent burnout. I will add a little bit more to what I said before. Um, so it's sort of actually echoing a lot of what's been said before. The people I've seen who I have had a lot of issues with burnout, a lot of them have fallen into two categories. They're the people who completely define themselves by their role as a doctor and their role in the hospital. And then when they have an experience in the hospital that does not go well, then all of a sudden they're the one thing that they've been defining themselves as they start to have to question. Um, and, and that doubt in that complete reliance on that one aspect of who you are as a person um, can really break someone down a lot. And so that's, that's where developing, you know, some sort of outside interest, some way to um, keep yourself tied to something outside of medicine is something that's com that just very critical to being a resilient person in, in this job and in this field. And then again, there are the people who are kind of on the way to thinking that maybe they don't want to be in medicine in the first place. And that's the other kind of bucket of people you might see who are struggling a lot with burnout also. And, and to be fair, again, a lot of the same things could be said of them there. If they had something that was again, keeping them more grounded, they might be happier in that job. But in terms of things that trigger burnout, which I think was part of your question, those are those are two kind of big things that I've seen. I think another thing that triggers burnout is bringing work home with you too much. Um, it's really easy to bring work home with you. Um, and I am certainly really bad at that. And I wear it like emotionally, uh, also just like literally having your computer out and like trying to do work and things like that. Um, but one of uh, one of my favorite attendings, what, and she has two kids. She's an orthopedic surgeon. She's doing great. We hung out with her like not too long ago. And what she does when she's home, everything goes away, and that's it. Bedtime is at eight thirty. After eight thirty, she can stay up and do whatever. But learning how to compartmentalize your life and give yourself the time to spend on other things is something that you owe yourself, um, which is something that I should do more. The kid. I mean, he's 40, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it, it happens. It's not it just like anything in residency is hard, <laughs> but also people are having kids. I'd say that's another question that depends heavily on what specialty you might go into. So in my own program in anesthesia, I think right now there two of my classmates are pregnant. Uh, two or three others have had kids during residency. And, then, and there's one other person who, again, did a lot of other things in life who came to residency with four kids. Um, in other specialties, though, so one of the nice things about anesthesia is that relative to other specialties, we don't have horrible work hours. In other specialties, that's not as true. And along with that, it becomes a little bit less common to have kids. I think overall in medicine, family, I guess, start, is becoming start, a bigger priority. It but is, people start families at a later age, on average, yeah, just because you're, I mean, you're pushed, board. like you're pushed back. You're like like arrested development kind of, right? Like like most some people like that are going into like jobs right out of college are like, okay, now I have a job after college, whereas you're like still taking on debt. And so I think that's a, a component of it. But so the, the, I'd say like the average age at which people start a family in medicine is later. And then certainly specialty dependent. Um, yeah, that's what I'll add. I think a lot of it too is your support system. So, you know, usually it takes at least two participants at the beginning, at least to have kids. Like whether or That's not, you are in school. yeah, right. <laughs> no. So a couple of years ago in the ortho program, we had a single mom come through, and she had a kid coming in, and she got pregnant, and then she and her partner divorced like during pregnancy. So like not everybody like finishes, you know, whatever partnership they begin with, and yeah, it was hard for her, but I mean, she also knew that at least the Hopkins Ortho Residency Program or wherever you find your home to be, like if having kids is a priority to you, great, go to somewhere where they're cool with that. 
Um, and Hopkins was certainly one of those I'm cool with that places and they helped her along. Um, that's not to say that every specialty or every residency is going to be as friendly or as supportive than others. Um, and you know, if, if having a family during residency is something that you want to do, great, awesome. There's a lot of sympathizers like to that effort. Just got to find them. One other thing I wanted to add quickly, I talked a little bit before about kind of the financial progress through medical school and residency. So based on what we've already talked about, you, you probably realize it's it's not impossible to have kids during residency. It's it's tough. You're not saving a lot of money. You're not paying off a lot of your student loans, but people make it work. <laughs> Just like as a general comment. Um, so I think a lot of the questions, especially about burnout or starting families, and often we are comparing ourselves to peers who have started their lives earlier. And I think that's a that's a way that's often framed, and there's a lot of truth to that. But I feel like, um, you know, coming from my undergraduate studies were in business. So a lot of my friends are in that initial really tough stage. And um, you'd be surprised at me how many people are pulling pretty hefty work weeks in other industries as well that are not medicine. I feel like what we do is uniquely challenging and that's clear and obvious. You guys will see that firsthand when you have experiences in healthcare. But, but life can be tough for a lot of people. There's a lot of people who aren't as fortunate to even have, you know, the ability to make the salary that we can start making even starting in residency. I know it's really hard to think about, but there are people here who make it work on a lot less with a lot more struggle. So uh, putting it in perspective for me has been my biggest asset of avoiding burnout because sometimes I go, oh, what was me? Especially as a student, right? I mean, it's a little different, but man, oh man, like how fortunate, like truly I can do what I'm gonna be able to do. Um, and there's a lot of people who work very hard who also make it work. So it's not, it's not entirely unique. I just want to add one, one part to that. Like, I don't want to begrudge the like financial portion of this, but, um, and I don't want to say for you to go into medicine for that reason, but you know, we're in a unique position where compared to people in law school, um, they're not guaranteed a job when they walk out. Medicine's not either, but we're at like a 98% match rate. I think it is for us seniors. So if you go to like a normal MD school, so you're nearly guaranteed to get a job starting at 55 to $70,000, depending on where you go for residency and what, um, subspecialty you're in. So I think that's something unique that you're able to make money after your four years. Um, I know a lot of people at, who did law school and they did, they were working as a bartender for over two years to try and like still find stuff. So put to put emphasis on one of the things that Chris said, if you're doing it for the money, you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> Full stop. You can get rich a lot quicker, a lot less pain. So it talks a little bit about how we chose medical school a little bit earlier. I'm, you can add your own perspective on that in a moment. Uh, in terms of choosing residency, at that point, once you finish medical school, you know what specialty you're shooting for. A lot of people have an idea of a subspecialty in particular as well. Um, and so you can sort of look up and see which of these different hospitals are particularly strong in those areas, which of them have people putting out a lot of research if you're interested in research as part of your career, um, which of them specialize in certain techniques that you can only learn at certain places. And then of course there's like just life considerations too. Is this in a city or a, a place in the country that you want to live in? Is, do you have family close by or another reason where you want, why you want to be in a particular area of the country? Um, after a residency, is that a place you might want to practice in and, and live in long term? Because that, you know, statistically, you're slightly more likely to end up practicing close to where you trained. Um, and then, you know, are you couples matching with someone and what are they interested in too? Um, those are all kind of the big factors that led into that choice for us. I can be kind of brief. Um... I'll echo the point about second look weekends when you're applying to medical schools. If you're fortunate enough to get into more than one, go to the second looks. 
spend time with the students and I hope that you'll get a good sense of what any place is about. I had, I picked my medical school cause it was the only one I got accepted to and it worked great. Like <laughs> I loved it. I was so happy there. It worked out well. It was pass fail. God bless. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's such a, it was such a good point. Like you're all like, if you're going to medical school and you're taking the MCAT and like you're suffering through that, like you're motivated. You don't need like an A grade to like pat you on the back and be like, I want to learn this. Like you're going to want to learn these things anyway. Pass fail is going to, yeah, I mean, you, I assume you, I'm just going to blanket assume you will. In defense of the letter grade. <laughs> There are also a bunch of schools that say they're pass fail, but in reality, what they are is they are secret rank. That's fair. Every, pass, every, low yeah. pass. No, that's everybody. Fail. Yeah. And you know what? My school does not. Low pass Huffington. fail sounds like. I believe that. Like 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 so I will say my my. <laughs> this is not like a this is not like a plug for Arizona because Lord knows there's like no reason for anyone to go like I mean it's a dry heat it's nice but like. Um, <laughs> But that's something to like take in mind, uh, to keep in mind. And we were a true pass fail because we didn't offer AOA, which really I think screwed a lot of people who wanted to like go into ortho. Huh. Um, <laughs> but so I loved. No, I wasn't AOA either. <laughs> I loved my second look. I think you guys should go to your second looks if you have more than one option for medical school, and I think that's the best way to get a sense. Um, interview days are short, and so you go into them kind of wondering like, how much can I actually tell about a place from an interview day? You can tell a lot. Like, are people like happy to be together? Are like people like messing around and then like going in study groups or like are people like are there counselors available to you if you're like a solo studier and they want to like work with you things like that and then from a residency perspective it's you guys can echo this like i felt like residency interviews were much more like humanizing i think in a way than medical school interviews where they just ask you like wrote like why do you want to be a doctor why do you want to be a doctor over and over again you have to be like like the same reason everyone wants to be a doctor like i really care about like humans but you, know, you have to come up with like a very clever way of saying it um but that said the reason i chose hopkins for internal medicine residency is because it's known to be one of like the most rigorous and one of the best internal medicine training programs and that's what i wanted i could have gone places i think where i would have gotten much more sleep but that was like what I wanted for my training. Um, I wanted to like not be surprised or overwhelmed later in my life. I prefer to have it up front. So that's kind of how I picked. But I think you, in residency, you get to like go out to dinners the night before your uh, interviews and like meet people that are actually part of the program and like see them in like a normal light, not just in a suit. So you'll you'll I think you'll get a sense of how like where you fit in. Oh. I thought it was. I think the number one thing for medical school for me was how I got along with the people in general. So when you go in your interviews, are you only being flanked by these physicians or these researchers or are the medical students there like trying to back you up? So when I came to Hopkins, I was, um, we interviewed with a medical student and then also a faculty student. So day one, I met my, my medical student, um, interviewer and it was amazing. I felt like that was the person I wanted to hang out with. Um, later in the night, I went to a party with them and it just just felt right. And I feel like that also is becoming more and more applicable for my residency interviews right now. For the couple that I've been on um, for some internships, it's basically a month long interview. Um, and I felt for certain programs, I was like, I can be with these people all the time. You need to be with people like you need to feel that because you're going to be doing 100 hours a week with these guys. So can you deal with that? Don't tell these. Sure. Fine. 80. 80. I lied. It's a work leak limit. Uh, <laughs> Um, but no, really, you have to figure out if you can get along with these people, right? And in, in the worst of times, when you have like a 28-hour call or whatever it is, and you guys are at each other's throats, or they're all at each other's throats, that's not going to work for you, right? Um, so you need to figure out what you value. Is it a fit? Um, is it pass-fail? Like, um, the one thing that you should think about, though, is if you actually want to do something competitive, then you should, like, if you have any inkling that maybe I want to do neurosurgery, or maybe I want to do ortho or derm, like, you should shoot for the stars, because connections mean everything uh, at the end of the day. So, Preface this with, again, if you're fortunate enough to get into multiple medical schools and you're making the decision, which is not everybody, and if it's not you, you're going to have a fruitful career no matter what. Like, I mean, it's going to happen. But if you are making a decision, like everyone said, fit was everything for me. I was into a couple top institutions. I went to the second looks and that was the decision. I was like, I'm a very feelings oriented person. And I was like, I felt best in Hopkins. I think I met you during second look. Yeah. 
It was really fun. And I had a lot of fun. And I'm like, these are people who I will feel supported by in those times of trouble. And it was, it ended up being very true. And feelings mean a lot. Um, for residency and the couple of interview days I've been at um, so far, because ophthalmology has an early match, so they're all over the place right now. Um, it has been a little more interesting because you get to see these residents like who are currently at the program and you get to like kind of talk to them and understand who they are, kind of the culture and just what it's going to be like to be an employee there versus a learner at a med school. I feel like at the med schools, they like to just convey information and how good they are. But for residency, it is a little more like, I mean, we kind of want you, we want you here. That's why we're interviewing you. So like, is this a place where you can thrive? Like that question has been asked more than others so far. So I think really paying attention to how you feel when you're at these places is super important. Keeping like a journal is important, like documenting your feelings because you'll be at a lot of med schools, hopefully, and remembering what it's like can be a little hard. So writing down your thoughts too is valuable. So for med school, when you're trying to go around and interview at med schools and everything, it's more so the medical school is trying to figure out who fits them, if you will. They can only accept so many people, and it's just the way it is. For residency, the residencies, for the most part, are selling themselves to the interviewees. They want you to like them. So it's a little different. But to focus a little bit on how to pick where you're going to apply or decide to interview, there's hundreds of medical schools in the country. You need to not apply to all of them, right? So like, how do you not do that? So there's a couple of directions that you can go. Uh, one of the stop gaps could be geography. If you know that you know, you've lived in Maryland your whole life and you are just like ready to leave, apply to like West Coast schools. Like it's not that hard of an equation, right? But if you know that you wanna stay close, like we did, you tunnel your search down to East Coast places and just decide where you're gonna stop. Is it gonna be literally just the coast? Is it gonna be anything east of the Mississippi? Fine, make a decision. Then you need to look at, I think, size of medical school. Uh, some medical schools are huge. They're like 200 people, and that's huge for med schools. That's, I know that's crazy coming from Maryland where, you know, you're two zip codes, but 200 people is big. <laughs> what? Campus itself is too, right? Oh, you meant the campus, not the whole state. I was like, what are you, oh, what are no, you no, talking no. about? No, 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 no. Maryland, like <laughs> College <laughs> Park. Yeah, yeah like 35,000 of your closest friends. You're not going to have 35,000 friends in med school. Um, but some med schools are more along the lines of 60. I think Case Western is around 60. So if that's more your MO, great. Just decide where you want to be on that spectrum. If research is important to you, then go ahead and do the whole like US News and World Reports and like rank by research and see who has that funding because if that's going to be important to you, you want to at least be in a place where that's going to be an option. If you're not so jazzed about research and like you don't want that being shoved down your throat like all the time, then don't go to those places because <laughs> you're going to get a lot of it whether you like it or not. Uh, and then I think speaking to the subspecialties is another important um, thing. If you know you want to do global health and make that a part of uh, your career, whether it be in med school or residency, you're probably going to have to go to a bigger program just because they have more pool with international organizations. So you're going to want to open it up with for that. Uh, so those are at least like three or four different ways that you can start to narrow them down. Um, once you get to residency, you know, you talk to your mentors and everybody tells you this will be a good fit for you. This won't and just listen to them. Um, for a large part, I think the mentorship program and the guidance uh, in the, what is it, like the pre-med uh, guidance folks here. Is Wednesday still here? Whatever. So yeah. Um, they'll help you point you in the right direction. But you need to come with them to know what you want or else they're just going to be like, I don't know, apply to like what everybody else does. So try to narrow it down in some way in a very pragmatic, systematic way.
Do you work in EDOs? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so our, our program has at least, and anesthesia at Hopkins is big. We've got like 25 people a year, and I'd say like two-ish a year are DOs. It's not like a hard and fast rule. It's just how it's worked out the past few years. Um, and I think the, some of the other residency programs at Hopkins also have DOs. And again, I, I, I think at other academic programs around the country, like there'll be different proportions of DOs in one direction or another. But I mean, it, in different hospitals, it's gonna vary by specialty and just kind of by the culture of that institution. Um, but yeah, uh, like I was saying before, at, at least at, at Hopkins for Anesthesia, our, some of our DO residents have been, I think, some of our clinically strongest residents out of our whole program. And for ortho, we don't have any DO uh, residents at Hopkins Ortho, uh, but we have international trained uh, doctors that come through and do their residency for sure. And some of our fellows have been DO trained. It's just, uh, at, I, for the most part, I think for most of the programs at Hopkins, it's so like research heavy all the time, and that doesn't usually fit with most pictures of DO schools. So I think that's hard to convert a lot of DO res or DO graduates into Hopkins residency programs. But certainly, I think we have a lot of fellows. And ortho in general has a good amount of DOs. I think there's 25% of AOS registrants are, that's like the ortho academy of people in America. 25% um, of them are DOs. One more question. Yeah, you guys have, yeah, you guys I have I life. You have to sleep, and, but you yeah. have lives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <sleep. laughs> Thank you so much for having us down here. Right, right on the board, yeah. type it up or something.